where we left off, if you'll recall, was the rather difficult topic of resonance. And it, it's a tricky thing. It's something, like I said, to, to be completely honest, I struggle with on some level to this day. I have to constantly remind myself that resonance is not an equilibrium, that there's nothing flipping back and forth. It's a time when the valence bond model, which 98% of the time is more than complicated enough for us. We don't need to worry about molecular orbital theory, but it's in those cases that the valence bond model breaks down for us. And that's what happens in species like benzene or the acetate ion. These things are resonance stabilized. Uh, the reason I bring it up is we left off with this kind of bogus manner of using arrow pushing. It's bogus because arrow pushing is for moving electrons. And we just got done saying in resonance, no electrons are moving. So you see why it's bogus. So many textbooks do this these days. Um, where we're going to go today is we're going to pick up where we left off with arrow pushing. And it is emphatically not bogus. This is the real deal now. Uh, we're going to start uh, dipping our toes in, so to speak, into um, uh, arrow pushing in the area of acid-base reactions, which is something you covered to some degree in Gen Chem. Uh, we're going to look at the more, uh, in a somewhat more advanced perspective. But in this way, when we start to, to use arrow pushing, I want to make it clear, this is not bogus. This is the way we will use it all the way through organic two. And so that applies starting today. So I think it's good. So um, uh, I'll leave it to you to review all of the definitions of Arrhenius acids and bases, which we don't use much. It's very restrictive. Uh, Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases, that's quite common or uh, the Lewis definition of acids and bases, which is in many ways the most general definition of acids and bases. But I'll leave that to you to uh, review, uh, to refresh your memories on words such as amphoteric, right? These are species that can be either an acid or a base. Generally, the star of amphotericity is water. That's the one that's always mentioned, and water is amphoteric. But it's not the only amphoteric species. Uh, ammonia, NH3, is amphoteric. Uh, when we get to our functional groups, alcohols are amphoteric, all of them. Um, amines are amphoteric. These are organic derivatives of ammonia. And later what we'll call primary and secondary amines, since they have at least one NH bond, those are going to turn out to be amphoteric also. So-called tertiary amines, that's a nitrogen attached to three carbon groups, those are not amphoteric because there's no H directly attached. They can be bases, but not acids. And we'll get to all that in due time. You know, I'm, I'm just sort of giving you a peek ahead as to where we're going with this. But water is not the only amphoteric species. Uh, also, I'm assuming that you understand the idea of conjugate acids and bases and how conjugates are a pair. One of them is the conjugate acid of the other. The other is the conjugate base of the other. Right? And the conjugate acid just has one more proton than the conjugate base. So hopefully fairly familiar stuff. Uh, what about um, how, how do we know when an acid-base reaction occurs? You know, just because you can draw a balanced equation, first of all, in general, does not mean the reaction actually occurs. Uh, and certainly that's true in acid-base reactions. And that's what we're going to get into first. Eventually, we'll refresh our memories on PKAs uh, and, uh, and show how that affects it. But over here, I'm... I'm assuming you guys, I assume you guys in chat can see the whiteboard. I think I have that selected. Uh, yes, good, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm complaining again, but I swear this setup changes slightly each time. Oh, well, you know, that's not your problem. That's my problem, and I have to be an adult about it. It is what it is. Uh, I'm just glad I can actually teach in person. Be that as it may. Uh, what you see here is an example of a typical acid-base reaction. And as written, you'll notice that I have drawn the equilibrium arrow so that it's, uh, the equilibrium lies to the right, that it's, it's uh, the way it's written. Of course, if I'd written the opposite way, I'd have to reverse the direction of the equilibrium arrow. It would then lie to the left, which would be also correct. It's just saying the same thing another way. But this reaction actually uh, is... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Spontaneous as written. This reaction will actually go. And the reason an acid-base reaction will ever go is because you wind up with more stable products 
than your starting materials. Your products are more stable than your starting materials. That's in general true about any chemical reaction, but it's surely true about acid-base reactions. And so uh, let's identify our two acids. Our acids are going to be the species with one extra proton, one extra H. So water is the conjugate acid of the conjugate base pair. Hydroxide ion is its conjugate base. And acetic acid, which is this one here, you might have written in Gen Chem, you might have written this as HC2H3O2 or something like that. Same thing, same difference. Uh, acetic acid is uh, the conjugate acid of the acetate ion. The acetate ion is the conjugate base. And since the reaction does in fact proceed to the right as written, this tells me that water is the weaker of the two acids. Weaker acid. And since we're doing uh, co colors, I always feel bad. I, I know there's, there's a few of you that are colorblind. It's, ac it's actually much less rare than you might think. So I feel bad. Hopefully the colors are at least dark enough you can see them. Uh, be that as it may, uh, so acetic acid is going to be the stronger of the two acids. And we can quantify that. We'll get to pKa's very shortly. Meanwhile, the very same th uh, thing is true about uh, the, 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 two, the, the, the two conjugate bases. The acetate ion is a weaker base compared to hydroxide, which is a stronger base. Probably not a big surprise. I think you're all used to uh, the hydroxide ion being, uh, being a pretty strong base. I will have you know there are stronger bases still, for sure. We might meet one later today, and we will certainly meet, one, meet some eventually. So uh, it, it sounds a little weird at first, I always thought, to say that you're going to wind up getting the two weaker species as, as the major products. But if you think about it, it makes sense that the products are going to be the weaker acid and the weaker base. Well, these guys are weaker. So this base isn't strong enough to go pull a proton off of a water molecule and go back to the starting materials, where you can think of it just as well the other way. Water is not a strong enough acid to protonate the acetate ion and go back to the starting materials. So although it sounds a little weird at first, I, I think if you put some thought into it, it makes sense that the weaker species, the weaker acid and base are going to be the products. And that will always be true, no exceptions. And so today we're going to investigate, first of all, how to think about reactions like this. I don't know how many examples we'll get through, but, uh, but we'll get through some. And also how to show how they occur using curved arrow notation. Let me just make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, good, I think I can live with that. Uh, one other thing before we get to uh, uh, the whole PKA business, which I know you just all loved. Uh, how would you use curved arrow notation to show this reaction occurring? Well, and, and again, like I said, this is definitely not bogus. Uh, remember with curved arrows, we have one rule, just one rule. They're always going to start where the electron pair starts since we're using them to show movement of electrons. That's what a chemical reaction is, movement of electrons. Uh, they're going to start where the electrons start and end where the electrons end. And there are a, a, a couple other sort of sub rules about that that I, I think I'll be able to familiarize you guys with as part of our recession. So um, I hope you'll agree the electrons are gonna start on the electron rich atom, which is this oxygen atom. It's got a full minus one formal charge on it. So that better be the place where, there's, where it's electron rich. And they're going to go wherever the, uh, the, there's an electron poor region. Do we have, I mean, the, 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 the most unsubtle case of all, I suppose, would be if there's something with a plus charge. Failing that, we don't have that here. What about a weak bond, a relatively weak bond? Well, what about the OH bond in this acid? Acetic acid's not the strongest acid in the world, but it's okay. So I think that OH bond is pretty weak. So we're gonna show the electron, the arrows starting at any one of these three lone pairs, doesn't matter which, they're the same, and we'll show it ending at the hydrogen because we're going to form a new oxygen-hydrogen bond. And by the way, the arrow does not have to look exactly like that in, in order to be correct. Maybe you drew yours underneath, fine. Maybe you started it at one of the other lone pairs, fine. That's yet another case of not only would I not take off points, but I wouldn't even notice. Now, if the arrow were in the other direction, then I would notice. That would be a problem. That would lose points. 
We never ever use arrows to say this H goes there. And by the way, there are some Gen Chem books that do exactly that. We organic chemists are horrified at such things, but it's unfortunately not rare. No, arrows are used only and always to show movement of an electron pair, always. Actually, it puts me in mind of uh, way back when I was sitting where you're sitting. Uh, my organic chemistry professor, I think for the second semester, said that organic chemistry can be summarized in one sentence. And I'm sure you're as interested now as I was then. That sentence is electrons tend to flow towards regions of less electron density, of lower electron density. I'm sure I wrote that down somewhere in your notes too. Electrons flow to regions of lower electron density. When a reaction occurs, when an organic reaction occurs, you've got two species dissolved in solution. One of them is going to have a place in the molecule that's relatively electron rich, like this hydroxide ion. The other one is going to have a place in the molecule that's electron poor. And largely, I would say, a goodly percentage of success in this class is learning to identify the electron rich and electron poor sites, because that tips you off as to where something's gonna happen. Anyway, the electron rich part of one molecule and the electron poor part of another molecule will now be attracted to one another, like little magnets, because they are little magnets. They're opposite in charge. And when that happens, uh, electrons flow from the electron rich area to the electron poor area. There are no exceptions. There are no exceptions. You probably heard that organic chemistry is about memorizing 60 bazillion reactions and there's no hope. Well, I don't, I don't take that view. In one sense, there's really only one reaction and that's it. Electrons flow from, one, from an electron rich area in this molecule to an electron poor area in this molecule. Every single reaction we ever learn will follow that rule. There are no exceptions. It's not arbitrary. So I think it's good news. Anyways, uh, so I'm not done. I've drawn only one of the arrows that I need to draw. As things now stand, I'm connecting this proton to that oxygen. And that's fine for the oxygen because it will go from a formal charge of minus one to zero. That's good. But as things are, this proton is still connected to the oxygen in the acetic acid molecule. And so we have to show that bond breaking and we will draw something like this. Again, it doesn't have to look exactly like that. You could have drawn it underneath. I guess uh, I would say that you want the arrow to end in the vicinity of the atom over here. We're showing that the electrons in the oxygen hydrogen bond are gonna end on the oxygen nucleus. And so that's how you get the minus charge. Right, we had two lone pairs, now we have three. So that's where that minus charge comes from. That oxygen is a minus one formal charge. So these arrows do not have to look exactly, exactly, exactly like that in order to be correct. There's some degree of variation. I would say as long as they start and end in roughly the correct spot, you know, if you drew this arrow underneath and pointed it at the bottom of the oxygen atom, fine. Once again, not only would I not take off points, I wouldn't even notice. I would just observe that's the same thing. Now, backwards arrows are a problem. They do need to start and end in the right place. And uh, I have a few rules in there uh, that actually were originally in my class notes for chapter six, which for us is still a little bit ahead. I've observed that over the years, over my years here, that some students, not all, and either way is fine, some students uh, get, uh, are helped by seeing some of these rules. So I make it available already in chapter two. So uh, I actually have that in the PowerPoint file uh, where your clicker session is or your reef session is. So I'll show you that later. You can look at it later if you like. If it's, if it's helpful, great. If not, don't worry about it. We'll eventually get there. So I guess one thing I would say if, you know, if this is the rest of my molecule over here, if this is my uh, acetic acid getting deprotonated, here comes that arrow from the OH minus. I guess if I had to, I mean, variations in what I've done are allowed. I guess I would ask that you show restraint with arrows like these, you know, don't go woo like that. Keep, be restrained, keep it near the, the atom onto which the electrons go. Make sense? Uh, can you explain the left red arrow? This one over here. What well, this starts at the electrons in the bond. It's, it's a good question. 
This arrow is starting at the electrons in the bond, and it's saying we're putting that pair of electrons, we're changing it from being a bonding pair to a non-bonding pair. It's going to end up on the oxygen atom. And you can see that. Over here, we've got three lone pairs, or as we started, with two lone pairs. So two of those lone pairs were there to begin with. The other one used to be the electrons in the oxygen-hydrogen bond. Now they're sitting in the oxygen atom, and if you work it out, uh, an oxygen with one bond and three lone pairs, or you can use that formula that's in your class notes, or any variation of that that you learned in Gen Chem, you can verify that the uh, formal charge in that oxygen is minus one. And similarly, the formal charge on the other oxygen has gone to zero. Now there's two bonds and two lone pairs. Would it not become a double bond? No, because you're, you're taking the bond away. The electrons that are in this bond are vacating the space between uh, the oxygen and the hydrogen, and they're going on to the oxygen. So it's the opposite of forming a double bond. We're going from a bond order of one to a bond order of zero. That bond is leaving from between the oxygen and hydrogen, which it has to. And by the way, these are great questions. Nothing wrong with these questions. But we have to take that bond away so that the hydrogen can form a bond to this oxygen. That's what this arrow on the right represents. We're saying that the electron pair that was a non-bonding lone pair is going to reach out and grab the proton and form a bond between oxygen and hydrogen. So this, this pair is going from non-bonding to bonding. This pair is going from bonding to non-bonding. And again, I'll show you the stuff I have from uh, chapter six that might help. No, no, sure, but doesn't oxygen form a double bond usually instead of having three lone pairs? Oh, I see what you mean. So. Uh, how come there's, I see, how come there's not a double bond here? Well, then the carbon would have five bonds around it. That's a problem. Oh, someone already said that. Now, uh, you could actually have pushed it in to make a double bond. That would be fine. That would be perfectly acceptable. But then you need to break the other pi bond and go to a single bond. That would be also fine. I, I, I can't say it's wrong. I guess it might be making things a little harder in your circles, but it's perfectly correct. Yeah, no, good questions. What about uh, in, in, uh, in not chat, any questions? Yes. The arrows are showing what, yeah, what will happen over that step of the reaction. And this reaction happens to have one step. Both of those things happen at the same time. Other reactions will have two steps, three steps, six steps. But, but that's a good point. We, we are implying by these two arrows that those two things happen at the same time. Is that kind of what you meant? Okay. Uh, I, I just want to make sure I answered your question. Those arrows are showing what's going to happen. Yes, I agree. Other questions? That seems good. Excellent. Okay, so where can we go with this? Um, trying to think. Well, maybe we'll start with the generalized case after all. Where are we at? 11, a little after 11. We have until 11.30. Okay, I think we'll make it. Good. Uh, well, let's get a little, let's start with sort of a generalized case. I think you, whoops, control C, control C. Let's go back to black. Um, I think you probably wrote things like this in Gen Chem until they were coming out your ears. Let's just do a generalized uh, acid dissociation reaction, which in itself is uh, an acid base reaction. So right, your, your acid HA is going to give up a proton and go to its conjugate base, A minus. And water is now going to act as a base here. And it's going to pick up a proton, and so you'll get the conjugate acid of whatever, I'm oh, sorry, the conjugate base of whatever that acid is. And you'll also get the hydronium ion, H3O plus. That's the conjugate acid of water. And you did these uh, left, right, and center. You did, oh, do they still call them ice tables where you figure out what the relative concentration is? You loved it. You could never get too much of it. Yes, I'm being sarcastic. And I, I, I simply want to remind you, all that is still there. That's all still true. I don't think you're going to be doing any ice tables in here. But it is still true, also still true is that the equilibrium constant of this reaction, you remember how to do this, uh, it's a product of reactants, right? So it's going to be conjugate base concentration 
times hydronium concentration in this case, all divided by conjugate acid concentration. And of course, we don't, uh, the, the, the term for water falls out of the equation, falls out of the form of the equilibrium constant, because for pure liquids, the, the uh, concentration is assumed to be one. So we treat it as though it were equal to one. So that's certainly all still true. And yes, if we wanted to, we could plug in numbers and figure out what the equilibrium constant equals. I don't think we're very interested in doing that. I'm not, and I'm sure you're not, but we could if we wanted to. I just want to point out that all that stuff is still true. And even this is really nothing special. Any equilibrium constant is going to be products of reactants, product concentrations of reactant concentrations. This is just the equilibrium constant for what happens to be an acid-base reaction, in this case, an acid dissociation. Why do I bring this up? Well, because these Ka values give you a sense of how strong the acid is. Uh, and that's really what we're talking about here. And as you can imagine, as the acid gets stronger and stronger, you're going to get more and more of these guys. The acid's going to dissociate more and more. And so that means the numerator is going to get larger and the denominator is going to get smaller. Likewise, the, the weaker the base, the smaller the value of Ka will get. And all that's fine we can certainly use Ka values, and sometimes people do. But as you may recall, the, value, the, the values of Ka typically are these numbers like 3.87 times 10 to the minus 12th. They're just not real convenient numbers. And so that's where this pKa comes in. And pKa is defined as minus the common logarithm, base 10 logarithm, of the acid dissociation constant. And these numbers are nice. They tend to be numbers like 6.3, 2.15, right, 11.8. They tend to be numbers like that. Uh, and just as stronger acids, we said this a moment ago, have a Ka, uh, uh, the Ka increases as the acid gets stronger. And for weaker acids, the Ka decreases as the acid gets weaker, other things being equal. Of course, for pKa, the exact opposite is true, thanks to that naughty minus sign. So the stronger the acid is, the, the lower its pKa is, and the weaker the acid is, uh, a weaker acid, acid uh, the higher its pKa is. So that's something to bear in mind. Uh, you will find a pKa table in your book. I would say I certainly am not going to ask you to memorize all those pKa values. Goodness gracious. If, if you had to memorize one, one really good one to memorize is the pKa of water. And I think you'll find it's in the upper teens, 16, 17, somewhere in, in, that, in that general ballpark. That's, that's good because that then gives you an idea as you're looking at other acids, is this acid stronger than water or weaker than water? And that's, that's not a bad thing to know, but I certainly don't expect you to memorize all those numbers. Uh, what I would say my goal is for you guys eventually is to get to the point where you at least have a general sense of roughly where something falls in the pKa table, even if you're looking at a molecule you've never seen before. Where roughly does it fall? Start with, is it a stronger acid or a weaker acid than water? You know, and, and begin to be able to get a sense. But I, I certainly don't expect you to memorize all those numbers. Any pKa values that you needed in an equation, as you'll, I, I think you'll see examples of this, both in OWL and when I put up some old exams, I would certainly give them to you. And OWL does the same. It makes those tables available. So certainly, please do not memorize all of those pKa values. Good, so I think that's all we need to say about Ka and pKa. Uh, good. Uh, what else can we say about stronger acids versus weaker acids? Well, uh, other things being equal, if one acid is stronger than the other and one acid is weaker than the other. Well, we already said that the stronger an acid is, the less stable it is in a sense, right? Because it wants to give up that proton all the more as it gets to be a stronger and stronger acid. Uh, you know, you can look at the extreme cases, something like sulfuric acid, H2SO4, really, really wants to give up that proton. And so that's why all of your very strongest acids 
are, uh, are completely dissociated in water, right? We don't even use an equilibrium arrow. It, we just use a regular arrow. It goes completely to the conjugate base plus water. You get 100% ionization. Meanwhile, weaker acids are more stable than stronger acids, other things being equal. And that makes sense. If an acid is relatively weak, it's kind of fine keeping hold of its proton, thank you very much. So it sounds weird at first, but I think if you think it through, it makes sense. Uh, what else can we say? Uh, um, oh, I can even say this going back to our original one with uh, acetic acid and uh, hydroxide. Uh, there's something else you can infer uh, about acid base strength, especially when you're comparing them. Uh, if, you've, uh, if you've got, let's say we have two acids here, right? Water and acetic acid. We're saying water is a weaker acid. Oh, I already have it here. That means its conjugate base is the stronger of the two bases. Hydroxide ion is a stronger base than the acetate ion. And that again makes sense. Since uh, water is, whoops, is maybe not all that excited about getting rid of its proton, that means its conjugate base would really very much like to pick up a proton, thank you very much. It's a stronger base compared to the acetate ion. The acetate ion is kind of fine not having uh, the proton attached, not forming the, its conjugate acid. And we'll find out there's reasons for that later on, structural reasons. I'll even give you a hint. It has to do with resonance, actually. And there are some other reasons besides. But that's another thing. I, I'm just here trying to point out some general ideas about acid and base strength and what are the sorts of things you can infer, how you should be thinking about it when you're looking at examples of acids and bases. And uh, with that, I think we'll be ready to go on to yet another example. I just want to see, yes. Okay, we'll do one more example of something like this in a moment. Any questions before we do that? Because I want to show you sort of like, if you have pKa values, what can you do with them? So let's clear that out. Um, Let's look at, well, first write it the way you might have written it in GenChem, and we'll also look at it from a more organic perspective. Whoops. That is, that's known as the amide ion. That's the conjugate base of ammonia, which is a really strong base. But ammonia is amphoteric. Ammonia can act as an acid. And I guess this reaction actually isn't so organic, is it? <laughs> We've got two inorganic species here, but we'll go on anyway. And we'll just remind ourselves of these lone pairs. And we're going to investigate which direction does the equilibrium lie. The products would be ammonia. Ammonia is the conjugate acid of NH2 minus. NH2 minus is the conjugate base of ammonia. And the other species would, of course, be the hydroxide ion. That's what it would look like if the acid-base reaction, or if the acid-base reaction went in the other direction, you'd have the hydroxide ion pulling a proton off of ammonia to give NH2 minus and the water molecule. And we'll go over that mechanism in just a second also. Uh, but, you know, that's all fine. How do we know it's gonna happen? Which, which direction the equilibrium lies? And the answer is we don't necessarily until, unless we have some pKa values. So let's put down the pKa's of the two acids. Water is one of our acids, and the pK of water is round in about 16. I don't think we need to get into decimal places. Uh, what about the other? And by the way, how do you know which is the acid and which is the base? Well, remember, the acid's going to have one more H, right? One more proton. So you have H2O, OH minus. That means that's OH minus is the conjugate base of H2O, and H2O is the acid in that pair. Likewise, NH2 minus and NH3, well, NH3 is going to be the acid in that pair. So, uh, uh, and again, I wouldn't expect you to have memorized these, but it turns out the pKa of ammonia is round in about 36. It's very high, also very messy. Whoa. Round in about approximately 36. So, let me just make sure I, I, I'm seeing that right. Yep. So 20 orders of magnitude difference. Remember the pKa scale is logarithmic. 
and it looks at first like, you know, 36 is a little bit more than twice 16. No, it, it's not a factor of two. It's 20 orders of magnitude. It's a gigantic difference. And which is going to be the stronger acid? The one with the lower pKa is going to be the stronger acid. The one with the higher pKa is going to be the weaker acid. That means that we can quite confidently uh, predict that the equilibrium ought to lie quite strongly in this direction. It's a little bit sloppy, sorry about that. Uh, when we write out formulas, do we include the lone pairs in formal charge? For now, certainly yes. We might eventually, that was a question in chat. We will eventually, certainly by the second exam, maybe relax things a bit in at least lone pairs. Lots of times where we get a little bit naughty and leave off lone pairs if we're not using them at the moment, if there's nothing special that we need to communicate. But for now, when we're just getting started in structure drawing, I'm gonna be picky. Uh, formal charge is a whole other matter. You always want to show formal charge. Uh, that, that's just best practice. But for now, let's, let's also, um, uh, and of course that wasn't aimed at that one particular person, right? I'm talking to all of you. Uh, which side does the reaction pr pr primarily lie? And let me make sure I wrote it right. I'm trying to imply that the equilibrium lies to the right. And so rather than, uh, rather than hydroxide pulling off a proton from ammonia and making water in the amide ion, instead, NH2 minus is going to pull off a proton from water and preferentially form ammonia and the hydroxide ion. And you can tell that by the pKa values, which again, I would not have expected you to memorize. But if you're given this data, you would say, wow, this guy's a much, much weaker acid than this one. So this is the acid that's going to react and it will get deprotonated by NH2 minus. How would we write the, uh, the mechanism of that reaction? Well, there's it doesn't have to look exactly like this to be right, but um, we might write something like, ah, crap. Uh, we might write something like this. Uh, we would show uh, one of the, uh, oh, that's a minus charge. <laughs> I'm going off about writing formal charges. Sorry, that minus charge is still there. We would uh, start by, uh, right, showing an electron pair on this nitrogen, that's certainly the most electron-rich atom around. And I could have started that from either of those two electron pairs. And then we will again break the hydrogen-oxygen bond. We'll put those electrons, we'll change that from a bonding pair to a non-bonding pair. And we'll put that electron pair onto the oxygen. And what do we then get as a result? Well, this nitrogen now has another hydrogen attached. It got that other hydrogen from the water molecule, and it used one of its lone pair electrons uh, to go from being a non-bonding pair to being a bonding pair. And it doesn't really matter which of those three bonds you consider used to be uh, uh, the lone pair electrons. It doesn't really matter because they're all the same. Uh, it sort of looks like in this diagram that it's that one that used to be the non-bonding pair. But that, that's, that, that's neither here nor there, maybe. And so the other species you get would be hydroxide. Sorry, those are electron pairs, and that's now going to have a minus charge. And sometimes people fault me for not putting pluses here. You can. This plus that gives this plus that. You can. It's not a big deal either way. So that's how we would look at that reaction from the perspective of an organic chemist. That's what we would call the mechanism of that reaction. The mechanism meaning what is the process, sort of like what, what you were asking about before, what is the process that the species go through in order to form their products? Uh, <clears throat> let's see. I really did want to get into Lewis acids and bases. Uh, I think intermolecular forces are something you can read about on your own. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left, 11 minutes. Let's maybe do our clicker session, may mainly to check attendance. And uh, after that, if I get to talk about Lewis acids and bases, fantastic. Uh, you'll also get lots of practice in all of these things on OWL. Uh, any questions before we do that, here or in chat? Would it not point left? Would what not point left? The, the reaction arrow or one of the uh, um, mechanism arrows? 
the reason these point to the right, it, it's only because that's that I put the water molecule on, on that side of the ammonia molecule. You don't have to. I'm not ammonia, NH2 minus. You know, it would be perfectly fine to write something like that. Perfectly fine, same thing. You've just drawn it on the other side. There's no rule that one is to be on one side and one is to be on the other. But the arrows do have to point in that in uh, in uh, in the right direction. So higher pKa value means smaller Ka value. Yes, exactly right. Uh, the reason and and the opposite is also true. The lower the pKa, the higher the Ka. And again, that's all because of that minus sign. When you say pKa is minus common logarithm of Ka, that's why that happens. But the payoff is pretty big. You go from getting stupid numbers like 3.81 times 10 to the minus 17th to getting nice numbers like 16.3. It just makes things much easier to conceptualize, I think. A uh, good, other questions then? This room is the, is not deep and wide, it's short and wide, <laughs> it's funny. Well, anyway, uh, good. Let me see if I can manage doing this. Uh, where is my PowerPoint? There it is. So hopefully you can all see this now. Let me, uh, I'm gonna do this right. Polling or quizzing? I'm gonna put quizzing because, oh, oh, I haven't tried this yet. Let's try it. What could possibly go wrong? There's one question and you get 10 points. And it'll be multiple choice, but you'll all press A to register your attendance. Right? We can do it either way. We can either just check attendance, or sometimes I do this, press A to register attendance. So we'll start that and we'll see what happens. Uh, let's see. Well, I get you know I have to click the arrow. So you can already start hitting A if you want. Let's see. This should start to change. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, do I have the right class? I thought I'd take the right section. One, okay, that's good. Maybe it takes a while to percolate down to your phone. So, uh, good. So hopefully, I, I think you guys even can see the, uh, can see the uh, question now. Does, I think it actually shows it in your phone, right? Maybe, maybe not. If not, you can surely see it on the screen, both chat and here in class. So these are examples of good practice questions. It's not showing in your phone. Okay, but you can, see, it did with the poll the other day. That's interesting. But yeah, you can see it in the screen. Okay, well, you know, these are still hiccups that we have to learn about. At least you're seeing it on, on uh, the lecture screen. So I would say, uh, you, you know what? Actually, this will be perfect because I included a Lewis acid, Lewis base reaction over here. So we can use this to, to go on. Yes. Oh, so it's something you can do in your end to be able to see it in your phone. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, as long as you guys can see it one way or the other. For those of you in chat, the student was saying that, for, that, you, that, that uh, depending on the process you use to put in your answer, at least I think that's what she was saying, you may or may not see it in your screen. But as long as you can see it with the lecture, I know that I'm sharing that screen now, so I know that it works. Oh, well, wait, there's way over 25 of you, though. Right, please do press A to register your attendance. Oh, is there something I have to do? Oh, okay. Well, please be sure you go all the way through the submitting process. And it might have been, you have to submit the quiz. Okay. Yeah, it might have been that there would be two questions, let's say, two multiple choice questions. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we would do one and then the other. But I just want to kind of get us through this. It looks like it's basically working. So please be sure you complete the entire process of pressing A and submitting your answer. Ah, since it is a quiz, you have to submit instead of just pressing A. 
I'm sorry about all these things on your end. It means that I'll, I'll have to try to remember if we really are just taking attendance. That was real easy. I'll, I'll just do taking attendance. But I do sometimes want to do some polling. So uh, you know what? I'm just going to leave that up for the rest of the class until people have mostly submitted. Uh, why stop it now? So uh, I do, where are we at in terms of time? Uh, 11.25. Okay, actually, that's perfect. Five minutes of my going through these answers, which, by the way, uh, these are going to be on eCampus probably later today. Uh, if not today, then certainly by tomorrow. Uh, so I've included the answers. I always will include the answers. Uh, you cert by the way, you don't have to write your arrows in another color. I'm just doing that to make it a little easier to see. Uh, but in the first case, wait, did I give you PK values? I hope I did. Let me see if I can, can't go back. Uh, let's see. Oh, I think I see. I'm, with, with this, I'm sort of, instead of giving you PK values, I basically said, assume that all of these reactions proceed to the, to the right as planned. And you can tell that by it just being one arrow instead of an equilibrium. Okay. Uh, I, uh, how are we supposed to get to, there is no question two. Yep, you're all fine. We're just doing one question. Uh, let me start the slideshow again so we can see that a little more easily. So. Uh, given the assumption that all of these reactions will proceed as shown, they all will. Uh, so we identify our base because it's going to be the thing that's lacking a proton. When we compare hydroxide to water, water is the, water's the conjugate acid, hydroxide is the conjugate base. And so we're going to show it pulling off a proton here. Uh, that This compound happens to be called phenol, by the way. We'll, we'll meet it later. But uh, just like before, uh, even as we form this new oxygen-hydrogen bond, we also break this oxygen-hydrogen bond. And we're left with the conjugate base of phenol and the conjugate acid of hydroxide, which is water. So that would be something like that would be how you would show it. Again, it doesn't have to look exactly like that. This arrow we're going over instead of under. It's perfectly fine. I wouldn't even notice. It's the same thing. Now, arrow backwards, I would notice. That's a problem. We never, ever use arrows to show this H goes here, ever. That is always wrong without exception. We only use arrows to show movement of electron pairs. They can be electron pairs as non-bonding electron pairs, or they can be electron pairs in bonds. But it's always and only used to show electron pairs. How are we keeping track of formal charge? Well, when we, when we attach another proton here, when we form this other bond, then this formal charge will go from minus one to zero. And you can verify that if you want to using, the, uh, using that formula. I think you all know that water is a neutral molecule, but you can verify that if you want to. Uh, what I find is after a while, you memorize not so much the formula, but you just sort of recognize, oh, here's an oxygen with three lone pairs and one bond, that's gonna have a formal charge of minus one. And over here, we've got an oxygen with two bonds and two lone pairs, that is a formal charge of zero. So this one, three bond, oh, sorry, one lone, one bond, three lone pairs, <laughs> formal charge of minus one. This one has two bonds and two lone pairs, formal charge of zero. One good check, by the way, uh, you, you learned this in Gen Chem, not only should the equation be balanced for mass, it should also be balanced for charge. That's still there, that's still true. So I think you'll agree the overall charge on this side is minus one, the overall charge on this side is minus one. That's an indication that we've done it right. Uh, something similar going on here. Here, I would ex certainly expect you to recognize the structure of sulfuric acid. That's one of the strongest acids that there is. And this molecule happens to be called ethanol. So it's an, uh, it's an alcohol and also the compound in adult libations. Uh, and uh, we'll learn about um, functional groups pretty soon. And you know, this compound is not the greatest base in the world, but when you've got something like sulfuric acid around, it's good enough. And so now we show one of the electron pairs on this oxygen. It's not always going to be an oxygen either, but that's going to pull off one of these acidic protons on sulfuric acid and leave you with the conjugate base of sulfuric acid, which is the bisulfate ion. In Gen Chem, you might have written that as HSO4 minus, which is not wrong. That's exactly what it is. And over here, you've got now the conjugate acid of ethanol. And so 
we used a lone pair on the oxygen to form another bond to that hydrogen. And you wind up with an oxygen that has three bonds and one lone pair. And if you work it out using that formula, you'll find its charge is plus one. And if we check the balance of the charges, this side of the equation has a, has a total charge of zero, and this side also does. You've got a plus one and a minus one, so the total charge is zero. So that's not a bad way to check that you've done it right. The charge as well as the mass should be balanced. Over here, we've got an example of a Lewis acid Lewis base reaction. And you have to remember that elements like boron and aluminum only have six electrons around them when they're in their neutral state. So they don't follow the octet rule. They can take on another electron pair, but only at the charge then of taking on a formal charge of minus one. So like I said, I'm sort of running out of time. Uh, this, uh, I, I'm gonna have to leave you to practice with Lewis acid, Lewis base reactions on your own. Actually, I think one of you sent me this exact reaction yesterday that they were working on. They got the mechanism right, fantastic. So this will be up for you to look at. And I also left some points over here. I'll put this on eCampus as soon as I can. Um, I mentioned that I have a little addendum. Uh, a lot of you are asking good questions about how do we know how to show the arrow? How do we know what it should look like? I have a couple pointers here that really I normally include in my chapter six class notes. Uh, so take a look at them. If you find them helpful, great. If not, don't worry about it. We will, uh, we will get to that eventually. But some people find this helpful to get some ideas about how to draw arrows. And with that, I think I'm out of time. So uh, let me close this off. And I guess I will see you all on Friday. Have a great day.